بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم I'd like to start with the ayah of the Quran Allah says which means we have honored the children of Adam ولقد كرمنا بني آدم we've honored dignified all children of Adam when we look at a an objective or maqasidi view of the of religion or the deen why did the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala send us faith systems from where we believe let's say from noah nuh to let's say musa moses isa jesus muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all these great prophets and messengers that we all revere and especially now we're talking about the Abrahamic faith systems uh, system from Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham, Moses, Musa, Jesus, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What was, from a the theological perspective, what is the point? Why was a human being commissioned to deliver a message from the creator to the creation? From our perspective as Muslims, for one reason, the objective is Sa'adatul Bashariya, the right to pursue happiness. The objective or the, the, the encouragement to pursue happiness as a creation on the face of the earth, to be happy. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we say down, uh, down the border. But the pursuit of happiness is the key so that you, from, obviously from a believing perspective, we believe that this is not the end of it. We believe that this is mm, a continuation of our pre-mortal life. And there is a continuation post this mortal life to another immortal life. We believe as uh, Muslims that we've been here before, meaning in the world of souls. <laughs> And also the other ayah, uh, verse in Ali Imran, that Allah Ta'ala talks about us from the back of Adam, alayhi salatu wassalam, etc. So we've been here for a while, spiritually speaking, and we're here to continue. And this is just one of the phases of our life. And that's why I always say one of the strongest, pre, one of the strongest connections we have uh, in, uh, from our pre-mortal life is to that unconditional love that Al-Wadud, the all-loving creator, has given us. That's why our souls sort of were bathed, if you were to say, metaphorically speaking, with the love from the creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, before we came into this uh, mortal sort of manifestation. And I, and I think the creator, the all-loving creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Wadud, created us with the capacity not just to receive but to also give, channel that, that love, live in a balanced life. Obviously, you all know, meaning, you know, do no harm to self or others. Can I use this mic as well? All right. All right. This was the premise. The premise is being good vis-a-vis -vis the creator vis-a-vis -vis the creation. Loving the creator is, by definition, uh, leads you to love his creation. That radical equity of all the creation before God, that you're not different than others, except by positive contribution. Al-Quran insists that, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شِعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ all humankind, regardless, you believe, you don't believe, you're still the creation of, of the creator. Uh, the creator tells you in this ayah that we've, we've made you into males and females, made you into tribes and nations, so that you can get to know each other. لِتَعَارَفُوا You can get to build bridges with each other. Not so that you can get to fight each other, or to hate each other, or to erect walls of hate under the banner of love, or all these things that we do sometimes in the very name of faith. And then the Creator seals this verse in the Quran by saying, Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum, which means the most honorable amongst you is the one who positively contributes most. Taqwa, positive contribution to self, 
and positive contribution to others. It's not the claim. Al-Quran, in fact, insists that as, as the Prophet ﷺ articulates in the hadith, that's the hadith of Sahih Sahih Imam Muslim, that Allah does not look, Allah does not look at your form. The Creator does not look at how you look, what kind of ethnicity you are, what kind of things you've done, but He looks at your heart, and what you've done. What have you done? How's your heart with the Creator today? And what have you done? What have you accomplished? Today, uh, another thing, let me say also, when it comes now to the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we've, we've often many faith systems, and that's not just Islam. Many faith systems have resorted to teaching, uh, to talking about the Creator from a, a ritualistic point of view rather than a spiritual or a comprehensive point of view. Islam looks at the creation also, reminds us that uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadith fi al-hakim authenticated by al-hakim kullukum li adam wa adamu min turab. Yes. Batteries are... No. Can you hear me all in the back? That's good. All right. Yes, ma'am. You can't hear? I'll try to speak loud. Um, that we're all, Islam looks at the human family entirely as, like I said, there's first radical equity before God of all human beings. And then also Islam looks at all human beings <coughs> as part of the same family. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith says, the Prophet says, Kullukum li Adam wa Adam min turab. All of you are from Adam which means we may be different colors, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, but at the end of the day, we are one people. These things are key when we talk about ritual to spiritual. Why? Because faith systems, not them themselves, I, I want to always differentiate, differentiate between religion and the religious. The religion is not always mirroring, the, or the religious are not always necessarily, or is not always necessarily mirroring the religion. Religion comes to give all people hope, all people growth, and all people opportunity. Religion that comes from the creator of all has no business in, in preference or favoring one segment of the creation over another segment. It wants to give all hope, growth, and opportunity. But sometimes the religion, the, the religious, don't necessarily like to go to the religion. One of the most beautiful things about the scripture, about the Quran. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. One of the be most beautiful things about all scriptures, all books that were that we believe were revealed by God unto the prophets. It's not just the factual things that are in them, let's say, or the spiritual things that are in them, or the, the, the guiding uh, 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 notions that are in them, but also their malleability. That they speak to everyone. Wherever you are, the creator of all, the all-loving creator addresses you directly and does not want does not keep any distance between you and him. And that's why Islam, in the Quran, Allah says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ He didn't say, فَقُلْ لَهُمْ إِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Usually, you know, the Quran articulates, if they ask, you tell them. But here, this, in this verse, Allah Ta'ala tells us, if, uh, talking, if, if they ask you, O Muhammad, about me, I am close. There's no need for you to tell them I'm close. I am close. When we, when the religious veils the religion, we turn now into a cult system. It's no longer facts, it's now figures. It's no longer substance, it's suspicion. The religion now becomes dwarfed into a list of do's and a list of don'ts. Do this, don't do this, good, you're good. We now go back to information rather than realization. There is a trip between information and realization. That, that journey is transformation. 
that information ought to transform you. Meaning what? Meaning knowing that I know that the creator, the, the all loving creator asked me to be good. Asked me to contribute. Islam asks you to contribute positively. And the Prophet وسلم, articulates in one of the Hasan hadith, the good hadith, meaning, uh, good meaning substantiated, uh, that if you have nothing to give, right? you don't have time to give, you don't have money to give, you don't have anything to give, he tells you, Your mere smile in the face of your fellow creation is an act of charity. As if the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, you don't have an option not to contribute back. If you've got nothing to do, then that mere smile is something, is a positive contribution. But you don't have the opportunity, or you don't have uh, uh, the, the, the right to remain non-giving. Islam teaches us that giving is actually living. You draw life when you give. And the more you give, the more life you draw. And that's why we glorify the prophets. Why do we glorify Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Why do we glorify Jesus? Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, may the best peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Why do we glorify Moses, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam? Because they've given unconditionally, they've given so much, and that's why they still live. Surely now when we ritualize any faith, we sort of now redraw the message that came from the creator of all. And that message came to address the mind, the body, and the heart. Not just the mind and the body. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you to pray, let's say, asked us all to pray, did not ask us to pray only with our mind and our body and leave our hearts behind. So when we're going, let's say, through the opening, the Fatiha that, we, that all Muslims read uh, at the beginning of their prayers, right? We say, after you say Allahu Akbar, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah. In the name of Allah, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Notice the first thing you have to start. And every verse in the Quran starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And oftentimes people in English translate ar-Rahman to be the merciful and ar-Rahim to be the what? The beneficial. Right? Something like that? What do you all do? What do you all say? Huh? More gracious, more merciful, right? Though Rahman, Rahim for all of you, uh, let me see. Here, let me write that down. Right? I, I can't help it. I'm a teacher. I know it's in Arabic, but look at that. I think you can tell that up to here, it's the same. This letter is also the same. Rahim in the Arabic language. That's the stem of the word. The stem, the linguistic, the root of the word is three letters. So the two names of Allah, the two names of the Creator, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, that you must start your prayer with, is actually the, the root, the root is, the linguistic root, root is Rahim, which means womb of the mother. And it always puzzled me how people translate the, the womb of the mother as mercy. Mercy has an element of pity. And the womb of the mother does not just give that infant or that embryo mercy only. How dare you dwarf and re reduce everything that the mother gives to that embryo or that infant to just mercy. The mother gives love, gives nourishment, gives protection, and gives mercy, and gives compassion, and gives, and gives unlimited giving. All these meanings are combined in Rahim, which the creator of all, our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, uses as his name, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, with his creation. So he doesn't just give you mercy. He doesn't just give you compassion. He doesn't just give you unconditional love. He doesn't just give you protection. He doesn't just, he gives you that and much, much more. And that's the first thing you start with. Bismillah. In the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. 
And that's not lip service. Now, when it becomes ritual, hey, I'll say it for a million times. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know how sometimes we pray. All of a sudden, he is five seconds. He's already in sujood. He's salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What happened? Man? Sounds like DHL Express. Or what do you all have here? FedEx. Yeah, it's priority overnight. I mean, yes. the first that we start. So going from ritual to spiritual. Ritual is saying it. You may be memorizing it backwards. You know how to say it in every language. The, create, the loving creator of all al-wadud is not, wor not concerned with the language that you utter. But the best language is that of the heart. That you actually, with your heart, you're saying in your name. The unconditionally com loving compassion. I don't know how to put it in English. How do you say the ar-Rahman? The unconditionally compassionately loving Creator, the unconditionally compassionate, because they both mean the same thing. I know they're back to back, and I don't know why people translate them differently. They ought not to be translated differently because they actually mean an exaggerated form of unconditional compassion and mercy back to back, not just one time, twice. Is there a message? If you utter it only, if you just generate the utterance, no. It's sort of, I'm just saying. It's like sort of people saying, I love you, but they don't mean it. All right, it's better than nothing. But that's not really the objective. It's the information to transformation. So after you say in the name of Allah, right, all of you are, you carry your passport, let's say when you travel overseas, and it says in the name of the government, let's say of Canada here, uh, you know, we request, uh, all authorities to facilitate for the bearer of this passport safe passage and whatever blah 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 all that nice stuff or maybe not in the name of maybe here you have you've got a queen all right yeah all right yeah you all have a queen alhamdulillah we don't have a queen but god save the queen um here you're not saying in the name of a queen or a king or a government you're saying in the name of the loving creator of all I'm starting. Because that love, once we start understanding it, once we move from ritual to spiritual, we start understanding the meaning of that faith that you're really communicating with the whole universe. And if you don't understand the language of love, then there's no way you can read, understand, or listen to that language that the universe generates to you. Because we're still communicating with the mind. And I always say, our souls are very, very good. It's the mind that plays tricks. The Prophet ﷺ, when Prophet Muhammad ﷺ came, and when Prophet Isa ﷺ came, Jesus, when Prophet Moses ﷺ came, when Prophet Abraham came, Yaqub, Jacob, all of them, it was a reformist movement, literally from ritual to spiritual. It wasn't that people did not have some kind of faith system. They did. But that reductionist attitude of the human being to reduce a faith into now something that serves maybe political needs, maybe, maybe uh, economic needs, or maybe even religious needs that, that, uh, that now, uh, religious needs that is devoid or not as much connected to the actual religion. It's now a box of rituals than spirituals. Because you all know, I mean, uh, religious tyranny is not something new that the world has not seen before. I always say there's, there are plenty of tyrannies in the world. There's religious tyranny and there's political tyranny. Political tyranny kills, steals, robs, does lots of things. Religious tyranny does all that stuff in the name of God. And the best way, and you see it nowadays in the world, the best way to mobilize people to kill each other is religious tyranny. Why not? Fuel that stuff and watch people just kill each other in the name of God or in the name of other gods that they erect, whether it's the god of democracy that they say, I need to kill you to give you democracy. I need to, I mean, all that stuff that people bring. Were there different other things that, they are, that, that are there? Well, definitely God, the creator of all, who is powerful, who is omnipotent, 
did not hire agents to do the executions for him. He could do anything he wants himself. But the, the movement, that reformist movement that the prophets came with, that's why it was resisted by the status quo all the time. Though it was fundamentally nonviolent. Fundamentally nonviolent. Why? Because violence is the language of the inarticulate to start with. No prophet of God, the creator of all, comes and tells people, no, I don't, we don't have any, the whole Quran is all in front of us. We don't have any, any verse in the Quran where a prophet says, yeah, oh God, Ya Allah, give me nuclear weapons. I want to vaporize those who don't believe in me. What we have is, uh, we don't have prophets asking for weapons of mass destruction. That's what wicked people do. Oh, that's lead, wrong people, let's say, on the wrong path. We have prophets asking for weapons of mass construction, mass instruction, to build, not to destroy. Destruction is very easy, but building is what takes time. And the prophets had to build the human character and refine it. The hum humans have all the ingredients. The creator created us perfect, all of us. It's that refinement of the human being that the prophets came to do, that, that, that refinement, that polishing, um, that injecting that, that spirituality in that human being to, uh, to maximize the potential. Why? Well, well because we're, it's, we're a very complex creation in the sense we're composed from an Islamic perspective, obviously. We're composed of, of two very contradictory elements. One, earthly, which is our body. Two, heavenly, which is our soul. So we believe a human being is made up of a body and a soul. That body is earthly. Uh, you're, born, you're part of earth. You're born from earth. Earth even feeds you to make you grow. Whether you're eating meat, we should sort of look at reducing that. Or you're eating vegetables, which you should increase. Huh? But both earth, give, Mother Earth gives them to you. You take them in. You grow, you grow, you grow. Eventually, Mother Earth is a recycling thing. Takes you in, recycles you, and all that stuff then goes back and, and does other things. Well, the body is a vehicle, we believe, in, in Islam, because you were existent as a soul before your body, and that's, why I, that's how you recognized love. The very first thing that we as creation recognized before our, uh, our, uh, this uh, mortal, in our pre-mortal life, was love. Because all we received from the creator of all is love. And we received that, that also as messages from the prophets of Allah that came. From all of them. And lastly, the last one, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that he said, what did to al-hadith fi sahih Muslim, I'm sending my love to my brothers. Uh, and and uh, the companions told him, who are your brothers, Ya Rasulullah? He said, uh, those are, aren't we your brothers? He says, no, you are my companions. My brothers are those who come after you. They love me without seeing me. So there's that, there's the sending all these love messages and our souls were receiving them. That's why I always say we're always, uh, our souls al are always ecstatic when we hear the word love, even if it's not meant. But someone tells you, I love you, even if it's not, they don't really mean it, you're, you like it. Your soul like, you're gravitated to it as if you're homing. There's, Homing, because that's what home was. And that's what home ultimately is anyway. So it seems like as if you've been now, you know, you've been estranged. It's a, it's a foreign environment. And now you feel comfortable in it. Anyway, the prophets, والسلام, when they came and gave us that, surely it was not, a reformist movement was not going to be met with ease. Uh, because a reformist movement, almost the movement of Jesus, the movement of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the movement of Moses, the movement, all these reformist movements were faced with challenges. But their movements was again geared at what I just started with, Sadatul Bashariya, the pursuit of happiness for all, and that we're all radically equal, and that we're all also are called to contribute positively. 
to leave this place, this plane, earth, better, or at least the same as we've received it. And that's not just to human beings. And that's why I, I'll share this with you also. Uh, the first hadith from uh, the brother, Allah bless him, who introduced me, went a bit, uh, you know, and they always do these, these virtuous sort of, they collect virtues about the person, supposedly what they think are virtues anyway. And they say, oh, he's this and he's that. And say, all right, he graduated from this, he graduated from this, thank you very much. All right, but anyway. Um, one of the first, or not one of the first, the almost traditionally speaking, Islamically speaking, traditionally speaking, the first hadith that a student of knowledge learns, a student of hadith learns. Hadith means prophetic traditions, right? We have Quran and we have hadith. Right? The first, the absolute first hadith, uh, traditionally speaking, that a student of hadith sciences learns from his or her teacher is called Hadith al Musalsal bil Awaliya. And I'll tell you this hadith as well. This hadith is called the al Musalsal bil Awaliya, means a hadith that's with continuous chain of narrators all the way to the Prophet, وسلم, all the way, right? One after the other. And that's the, how, what the teacher gives the student as the first hadith, first prophetic tradition. And then that student gives, when he becomes a teacher, gives it to students and so on. And it's all, all the names of the people are recorded and chained all the way, meaning with a, a chain of transmission all the way to the Prophet ﷺ. And that hadith is this, the Prophet ﷺ tells us this, and I'm narrating that with a continuous chain to all of you, that the Prophet ﷺ, so through my teacher, through his teacher, and then on the authority of his teacher, the authority of his teacher, and then, you know, let's just, it's 1400 years, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahman. Those who are unconditionally compassionate are eligible for the unconditional compassion of the most compassionate. Irhamu man fil ard. Look at the hadith, continues. Have, show your unconditional compassion to those on earth. Yarhamukum man fi sama. The Lord of heavens will show his compassion unto you. D did you pay attention to the words? He didn't say show your compassion to human beings. Show your compassion what? To everything on earth. Well, if we are in ritual... <laughs> If we are ritualistic, no. Ritualistic is what makes me better than you. Ritualistic becomes iblisi, satanic in a sense, because it's cultish. I am right, you're wrong. Why? Because I have a theoretical, I've negotiated a theoretical conviction in my mind that makes me better than you. Or intrinsically, I'm better than you because of one thing or another. You all know the whole uh, ordeal from our perspective from our Islamic perspective about shaitan, about uh, uh, the devil or Iblis or Satan. Uh, surely Islam looks and says uh, the ability to be Satan is not just restricted to a figure, it's in a human being, simply because of the earthly and the heavenly component. We have the potential to actually rise heavenly as high as heavens or stoop way down to the deep depth of earth in a metaphorical way, to do the most wicked and evil thing, or we can actually, we have the potential to be the best of things. Both. There you go. It's the choice that the Creator enabled us, enabled us to make. But the first uh, rec record we have of, of with, with the, uh, with Iblis, with Shaitan, or the, with Satan, was when he told the Creator of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told him, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the devil to honor Adam, our father, all our father. And uh, the devil refused, citing what? Qala ana khayrun min. I am better than him. Why? He says, I am made from fire, and Adam is from earth, from clay. Okay, but the question, the creator of all, subhanahu wa ta'ala, never asked Satan, what are you made of? He said, honor him. I am made of fire, he's made from clay. Indicating that what? I am better than him because intrinsically of what I am. 
of what or what's the, the material I'm made up of. And that's, I always say, the devil is the father of all kinds of prejudices and racism anyway. Oh, that's, their, that's their ideological father. <laughs> There's no, because I am better just because I'm different. Are, are you for real? I mean, what happened to uh, merits and positive contribution? That doesn't matter? No. I am better because I'm from fire. He's worse because he's from clay. Okay. But that was not the question. The question, would you, will you honor him? No. I'm not going to honor him because I am better. But notice what I always say, what, what Satan had for, forgotten about about Adam alayhi salam, our father, is surely our father is made from clay or from earth. And, 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 and Satan was made from fire. And Satan was fooled by his firepower. He thought firepower is what makes you right. Might makes you right. Well, some people still think the way Satan thinks. What I always say they for, Satan forgot is that clay is power. But the difference between the power of clay and the power of fire is very simple. The power of fire is destructive. The power of clay is building and constructing. And that's why you're the children of Adam, not the children of Satan. Because like your father, Adam, you're supposed to build. That's where your power is. And to prosper and to grow, not to destroy. That's, it's easy to destroy. When faith becomes reduced to uh, rituals, it becomes, I'm better than you because I perform better rituals. It becomes now, my rituals are better than your rituals. And I have to look down at you because you're not the same rituals. Because your value now is the rituals you negotiated in your brain, intellectually, rationally speaking. It's not the spiritual, the soul, that is radically equal, nor is it your positive contribution. That's why in cult systems which act as or masquerade as religions, uh, one who performs similar rituals to me is better than the best people on the, from the other side. Who cares about them? Because the value is no more on positive contribution, on real stuff. The, the value is no more on the essence of the human being. The value now is placed squarely on the rituals that you perform, whether you believe or not believe in them. Makes no difference because it's a rational thing now. But the Qur'an does not want us to stay, all right? It, it's, it's important not to sort of go and take religion and, and make it mythical, sort of myth systems and stories and Alice in Wonderland business that many people do and turn it into sort of like a bedtime story. A religion is supposed to sort of connect you to the creator of all, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves you and, and that you actually love him as well and be connected with him throughout your day and night. Throughout everything that we do, and that you see him, metaphorically speaking, when you're dealing with your parents, when you're dealing with your family, you deal with them with love. Why does the Quran say, Wala taqullahuma uffan? Don't even say uff to your parents. You've got to love them. You've got to show them that love. That's part of you being a believer. It's not just saying uff. Don't say anything to them that's, that's disrespectful. You gotta show them that love. You gotta have to. You have to embrace them. When we don't do that, it becomes the rituals fight each other, and the rituals become more cult. We reduce the faith into cult system. It's no longer religion that offers all people hope, growth, and opportunity, or not even you. It's just simply do this, and that's it. And that's why what happens is we say, all right. So in in our salah and our prayers, we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim without really feeling that we're, without being in the state, not just, it's not a matter of feeling, being in the state, experiential aspect, the experiential dimension of the prayer, in the name of Allah, the all-loving, the unconditionally compassionate, I am invoking his name. And then the first thing you stand is, Alhamdulillah, the station of gratitude. Alhamdulillah means thank you, O oh Allah. Alhamdulillah. It's one thing to say alhamdulillah, lots of people say alhamdulillah, right? 
uh, everything. Alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. Thank you, thank you, Allah. But an attitude of gratitude is, a dif is different than a word of gratitude. That's why Muslim theologians have contemplated what's better to say, what's better, love or gratitude? And many said gratitude. Because with love at a first, at a beginning level, you're, there's expectation for reciprocation. And to the human being at a beginning level, it's tangible reciprocation, meaning material. I prayed, why, why, am I, why did I lose my job? I, I, I just prayed. I mean, what happened? So there's that sort of business transaction. With gratitude, you're saying, Ya Allah, thank you. There's no expectation for reciprocation. You're just thanking him. And that's why gratitude is important. The Prophet in the Hadith Sahih Imam Muslim, he says that those who are not thankful to people, those who don't show gratitude to the creation, are ungrateful with the Creator. Sign that you're grateful with the Creator is that you're grateful with, the, with his creation. When you see people not ungrateful with the creation, grateful with Allah. Straightforward. There's no if and buts about that. So Al-Fatiha, the opening, takes us through that journey from information to transformation or information to realization, from ritual to spiritual. Because the point of saying Alhamdulillah is not just to utter it, thank you Allah, but to live it. To live it. To actually say it with your heart, not just with your mind and your tongue. But your heart is in a state of gratitude. Your tongue is in a state of gratitude. Your mind is in a total state of gratitude. All right, you're, you're starting to walk. But if you just utter it, even if you memorize it in whatever, so what? You're just saying it. And therefore, there's no progress. You're still in the ritual. And therefore, that faith, no matter how, how strict conservative you are on the rituals, that faith, is not making you a positive contributor to others. You're still boxed in the selfishness of the ego of the self. You haven't broke free. You haven't gone to where you're supposed to be. To be a, like the Prophet wasallam is telling us, Al-Mu'min kulluhu khair. Hadith is authentic. The believer and Muslim is just all good. There is only good in you. There is nothing else. Why? There is no time for anything else. And there is no space for anything else. The journey from ritual to spiritual is there. It just needs to be enacted, I think. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. The ayah continues. The verses continue. Maliki, Yawmiddin. Iyyaka na'bud. Ya Allah, you we worship. Wa iyyaka nasta'in. Why do you think Allah says, Iyyaka na'bud? You we worship in a plural sense. Why didn't he say Iyaka A'bud in a singular sense? You're supposed to be, you're praying, you individually, you're saying, you I worship, O oh Allah. But Al Quran is not telling you that. It's telling you to say, which means you we worship. Huh? To go from ritual to spiritual. It's never about you, it's about we. Why? Because you see, again, Islam looks at it from this perspective. If you're addressing the creator of all, it's good to include yourself among all those who worship him. You're not just by yourself. You're among all his creation. And Islam also shows us one important thing, that not everyone's prayers are on the same level. Not necessarily everyone's prayers are on the... Uh, most purest of levels. Some are better than others. Some are more pious than others. Some are more transparent than others. And Islam tells us, as the hadith in Sahih Imam Muslim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember the hadith that uh, Allah has angels that roam earth. They look for those who are in reflection, those who are meditating, those who are contemplating, doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once they find them, they gather around them, and then, anyway, they report to Allah, and he's all-knowing. And they say, Allah tells them, I have forgiven all of them. They're all forgiven. 
one of the angels reports. He says, but one of them is not a regular. He doesn't just come always to remember and reflect and contemplate. He happened to be passing by and he saw them sitting, so he sat with them. And Allah Ta'ala tells, Allah Ta'ala says, which means, and walahu ghafart, and to him, oh, oh, I've also forgiven him. I have forgiven him because of association with them. It's we, not just I. So you say, Iyaka na'bud, you're gathering yourself, you're forcing yourself with everyone that is abid of Allah, all of them. And if you put yourself with those who are maqbul, you also become accepted. If you put yourself with those who are accepted, you're accepted by default. As if the tarbiyah or the education that Allah Ta'ala is putting us through in the verse here is to move from ritual to spiritual. It's not just about you, it's about also we. Maybe the me, we put it up, it becomes we. Well, it's got to go. Things have to go be up, not down. Me is down and we maybe is up. A lot of things that we do simply, like I said, saying thank you in, in, in Islam. While the Prophet ﷺ told us that if you're not thankful uh, to the creation, you're, you're not thankful to the creator. But thank you is not just merely saying thank you. It's a matter of the heart. Again, separation. when we separate the ibadah from an issue of the mind and an issue of the heart, and we say, all right, it's just the mind, it's not the heart. Mind and body, not the heart we'll come with bizarre forms of hypocrisy. When we separate, right? so there are three things I said, mind, body, and heart. When we just worship the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala with our mind and body, and we're separating the heart, it comes here, we practice it, sure, right away. We'll come up with bizarre forms of hypocrisy where we'll tell people, yeah, I love you. You don't really mean it. Uh, will you help? Yeah, I will help, but you'll never help. Uh, who will volunteer? Oh, sure, I'll volunteer. Why not? Uh, you know, theoretically speaking, I'm ready to volunteer, but not. Will you forgive? Oh, forgiveness is a for, for, virtuous thing. I'll forgive, but your heart is not ready to forgive. You won't. So we, we come with all kinds of things. We believe one thing in our mind, and we practice totally the opposite on the other side, simply because we're actually... Now, yielding the heart totally out of the equation. It's not. The faith is not coming from the mind first, conviction, to the heart, and then is implemented by the body. The faith is coming, all right, let me do this, because if I do this, look, I'll eventually, uh, the Creator will reward me, will give me something. There's something in it for me, so I am doing it. And Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran and in the Prophet in the Hadith in many ways, that actually... Uh, these acts of rituals, if you void them from the spiritual part, they, don't, they lose their efficacy. They lose their efficacy. That's why the hadith, for example, the uh, Quran, Quran says, in the, tanha in wal munkar. the prayers are to prohibit you from saying evil and doing evil, both. How come we pray and we still say evil things or do evil things? Well, because we're not really praying in a sense. Because what? We're praying with the mind and the body. The heart is not there. I always say when the heart and the, and the, and the mind fight, meaning there's a conflict between what the heart wants and what the mind wants. You all know who, win who wins at the end. The heart wins. You like to smoke? Hope hopefully you don't. Mind tells you smoking will bring you cancer. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Your heart likes it? Guess what you're going to end up doing? You're going to smoke. doesn't matter what the mind tells you. Mind can tell you whatever it is. Whenever we separate the mind and the heart, it becomes the same thing. It becomes these kind of hypocrisy that we always, we say something and we do something else. Islam does not want us to give pamphlets to others. A lot of people misunderstand the, the issue of da'wah. They think da'wah is to print pamphlets, give to others, or do this. Islam wants us to be a walking, compassionate person who cares about, who positively contributes not just to self, but also to everyone and everything. The more we dwarf in our faith into rituals rather than spiritual, the more we all will lose. And the more the faith will become more like a cult rather than a religion.
And any faith system is like that. This is a human phenomenon. So it's, I think it's important for us when we, all right, I'll give you an example. You all know. Hadith al-Bukhari an Abi Huraira. You all know hadith. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu. Very nice. One of you, the Prophet says this. One of you would not be a believer until you love for your fellow human being what you love for yourself. Yeah? Good. We all believe it. Prophet said it, we believe it. We, probably most Muslims memorize that, this hadith because it's a famous prophetic tradition. Yeah? How many practice it? How many actually love? The Prophet ﷺ used the word love. Yuhibbu. Not like. No, 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 no. Yuhibbu. One, one of you would not be a believer until you love for your fellow brother. What you love for yourself. You say, yeah, I, there's few people I love and I would love for them to have most of what I have. Or most what I love. Nah, you're not a believer. And that's those I like. But the Prophet's hadith did not say those you like. It's easy to be good to those who are good to you. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're expected to be good to those who are good to you, but if you're good to those who are good to you, then what good are you? I mean, but that was not the prophetic instructions. The prophetic instructions, you would not be a believer until you love for the other, your, your fellow brother, what you love for yourself. Love. All right. We don't practice this, hey, that's how you become ritualistic rather than whole. You say, I believe in it in my mind, sure, but I don't practice it. In fact, I actually practice the opposite of it. I want to always keep people behind, but that's not faith. The dangerous thing in this, the Prophet says, La yu'min, one of you would not be a believer, and he would not be a complete believer. That faith is incomplete. It's not really complete faith. It's not just that you're, there's no faith. Another hadith, and all, Sahih also of Al-Bukhari, all of you know it. The Prophet ﷺ says, لا تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمنوا You will not enter paradise until you believe. ولا تؤمنوا حتى تحابوا You will not believe. You will not have faith until تحابوا not to hibbu. To hibbu means until you love each other. Tahabu means until you radiate love. Let's look at the hadith again. Lanta tul jana hatta tu aminu. You will not enter jana until you believe. Walan tu aminu hatta. You will never have faith until you radiate love. Until that illumination of the Quran and the Sunnah and from the Prophet enters your heart and illuminates you, rendering you a fountain of radiating love and illumination, not simply just loving yourself, because that, that's, that's you're shortchanging yourself. لَن تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَحَابُوا You will never, لن, ل, never, not just you won't, you will never have faith until that love settles in you so well and you radiate it to all. That's the difference between ritual and spiritual. We've all memorized these ahadith when we were kids, right? All of us memorized them. It's never about memorization. That's what rituals say. It's internalization. That's the trip to spiritual. Or that's the trip to, to, uh, to realization. What do you think made the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in different? Practice what they believe. You believe it? What are you doing? What are you waiting for? An RSVP? I mean, you already have it. It's the practice. And I think that today, there's, in today's world, it's a polarized world, and there are lots of crazy, crazy things happening everywhere in the world. Don't let that make you hopeless. Because people, the creation of Allah Ta'ala, the creator of all our good, there's that soul in them still that's pure. There is that potential. Every human, Muslims look at every human being on the face of the earth as either a, uh, a saint or potential saint. 
Meaning if you're not a saint, then you're potentially a saint like this. Who stops guidance from you? Who stops illumination from you? It's that eligibility. It's that working. It's thinking, ya Rasul, you are the messenger of Allah. So when we say Muhammadun Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means you are my way to know the creator of all. Well, he told you you would not be believed until you do this. Right? Another hadith. La yu'min, whoever, if you, you would not be a believer until you honor your neighbor. Remember the hadith? Man kana yu'minu billahi wa liyamakha falyukrim jara. The hadith is known. Fi za'i al-Bukhari Muslim as well. All right? In the authentic collections of both. You would not be a believer until you honor your neighbor. I mean, he's not just saying it would not be perfect. He's saying you would not be a believer. Oh, but I, I, I don't want to go that extra mile. Rituals. And that's why rituals will... Information does not change people. Realization does. You see, today, in information, we're going to be outdone with information with artificial intelligence coming soon to a theater near you. Absolutely. You can get a small uh, memory stick with information that knows more than all of us. Google uh, search engine knows. Information is plenty out there. It's not the information that we're looking for. It's the transformation that we're looking for. It's that, that transformation that makes the human being Rabbani, as Allah says, وَلَكِنْ كُونُوا رَبَّانِينَ But be godly people, a Rabbani person, not just insani. That requires to take the step of when you say Bismillah, you know and you actually experience. It's the experiential dimension of invoking the name of Allah. And then when you say Alhamdulillah, that you stand in that attitude of gratitude to the creator of all. And all of you is in absolute gratitude to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start appreciating things. You, we worship. All of us, we worship you. And it's not because of my worship. Maybe you're accepting me because of someone else's worship, not because of me. But I want to force myself to be with we. Because at the end of the day, it's we. And your mercy is over all of us. If we don't bring back spirituality and a wholesome approach to the faith, we risk alienating the faith, and we risk also turning into cults rather than religion. And trust me, cults are very good at erecting walls of hate under the very banner of love. Cults are very good at erecting walls of discrimination under the very wall of mercy. Cults are very good at being driven by greed envy and ambition, but in an order to cloak all these self-serving emotions and sanitize them, we cloak them in religious rhetoric. So I don't want to talk too much. I think I've talked already enough. It's, it's our call and it's an individual call. It's a call to action, to actualize, to enact that which we already know. It's not about having more information. I know today in the many of the MSAs and others in the mosques and everywhere, we think that the answer is let's have more lectures. Let, load me up with more info. All right, so here's more info. And lo, more info. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm still, my faith is still weak. I need, it seems the answer is I need more info. And you get more info. But my faith is weak. Right, let me, load me up with more info. And then we have oversaturation of information. Satiety. I mean, it's plenty. But there's no realization. There's no transformation. And I think it's starting, that going back to baby steps, one thing at a time. Practice that very small sunnah of smiling, the prophetic way. Smile. And remember, when you're smiling, you are spiritually also connecting yourself to the Prophet wasallam, the unconditional mercy to the world. And start now practicing one after the other. Listen to the Quran. The Quran is speaking to you. The Quran is not a newspaper. The creator of all is talking to you. If we don't do that, I don't think it would be the fulfillment or, the, or a fulfilling life, spiritually speaking, the way a faithful person, a person of faith thinks. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And uh, let, let's, let's take a step. Let's try to do it. 
the Prophet Sallallahu mission was a wish for a better world. That's the whole mission. Rahmah lil alameen means what? A wish for a better world. Faith is a matter of choice, whether people believe or not. Mercy and love is something that's the right of everyone to get. That's why he's rahmah lil alameen. And he's bil mu'mineen ra'ufa rahim. So Allah Ta'ala bless you and all of you. I know you probably have exams coming up soon. Yeah. All right. So all the best study, y'all. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll feel free. I'll try to answer the best, to the best of my knowledge. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sheikh, the first question is that... Uh, <laughs> 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 Sheikh, the first question is that... Use the mic so they can hear you. Uh, so the first question is that I got a tattoo about a year ago, which I regret getting. What should I do about it, and would it be sufficient to get removed? We have a prophetic hadith that discourages from having tattoos. If you've done that, seek Allah's forgiveness. <laughs> because Islam doesn't believe believes that your body is not your property; it's actually His property. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, and you actually lease your body. That's why you don't have the right to abuse your body in any way. It's because it's not really yours. I, I know I'm saying your body, but I'm saying it's not really yours. You lease it, proper conditions, you treat it well, you treat other people as well, and you know, you gotta get permissions for doing things to your body that's beyond your property. It's not your property. You don't own, you just lease. So, treat it well. Eat well, but don't eat excessively. Drink well, but don't drink excessively. Do, well, maybe you can drink water excessively. Then you have water intoxication, then you have ADH problem and all that business. SID, ADH. Right. Um, the next Sin. question is, what are some steps one should take in order to increase their spirituality during Salah? And just a reminder for everyone, if you want to send in a question, you can go to one of the links, and inshallah send in your question anonymously. I brought the issue of salah on purpose because that's a lot of people think about. I, I, I always say, encourage myself and you, live your salah. Don't say your salah. Some people say, I'm reading my salah. I don't know where they got the word reading from. It's, be, it's being in it. You're stepping into this world. Observe that you're observed. You're in His presence. You're in the Creator, the low loving presence. Live alhamdulillah. Wallahi if, you, wallahi, if you start saying alhamdulillah with your heart, not just with your tongue. It's a different story altogether. And sometimes you have to practice, I mean, at least for me. I'm a weak person, I'm a sinful person. So I, I practice alhamdulillah a few times uh, sometimes when alhamdulillah. Until I try to sort of cleanse it. I am really thanking you, oh Allah. I'm thanking you for all that you're giving me. It's got to come from your heart and it has to be pristine and transparent. Allah asks you for one thing only, transparency with Him. Be transparent. That's all, that's all you need to be, transparent. Nasiha means transparency, right? When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells you, Hadith Imam Muslim, and Tamim bin Awsir Dari al-Hadith, right? And Deenun Nasiha, two words. Deen is transparency. Nasiha means transparency. He tells you only a deen and nasiha. Deen is transparency. That's it. With whom, Ya Rasulullah? With Allah. Transparent with Allah. What you tell him, you believe in. You actually love and you practice. With whom? Ya? With Rasulullah. Yani with the Sunnah. You hear one of you would not be a believer until you love for each other what you love yourself. All right. Then you're practicing transparency. What's in my heart is what's in my mind. It's what I do. Uh, with who? With the rest of the people. The whole hadith. You all know the hadith. Right? Some people think that deen nasiha means deen is to give advice. Nobody wants your advice. <laughs> Nobody wants your advice. And if you're good, give yourself an advice by being transparent. Nasiha doesn't mean advice. Nasiha means transparency. But because giving advice is supposed to be giving other transparency, it's called now transparency. I'm asking you for your honest transparency on this. I'm asking you for honest nasiha, advice. That's the linguistic stem of it. Um, the next question is, in your opinion, what is the most reliable source to read about the hijab? 
The most reliable source in Islam is two things, the Qur'an and the authentic prophetic sunnah. <laughs> Standard one. Um, what am I supposed to say? Other thing? Um, the next question is, do you have any tips on how to focus better during salah? Lose the focus. <laughs> You're focusing on what? Live your prayer, I just said. Focusing on what? On how to say it? Okay, memorize it before you get in the prayers. Now you know it? Now live what you say. Live, you say Alhamdulillah. 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 Experience Alhamdulillah. You say Iyaka na'bud. You we worship your Allah. Iyaka nasta'een. You we seek help from. We beseech your help. Help me. Be with me. Ihdina. Ihdina. Ya Allah, guide me. Guide me, guide my steps, guide my hands, guide my looks, guide my words, guide my actions. Guide me. I need your guidance. Feeling or not. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you all know the hadith of Sahih Muslim. We have a very weak hadith that Al Bayhaqi narrated. And this is from Dawood, David. Right, King David or Prophet, we call him Prophet David. Allegedly, because it's very weak, allegedly Sayyidina Dawood, our master David, may the best peace and blessings be upon him. Because we in Islam we don't believe in subtraction, we believe in addition in a sense, meaning we don't believe in just one prophet, Prophet Muhammad, we believe in all of them. When you believe in Islam, you don't sub you don't let go of any prophet. We love them all, and we believe in all of them, and we think they all had the same message from the same Creator. But anyway, so allegedly, Sayyidina Dawood, King David, alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, asked Allah, "Rabbi, aina ajiduk? Ya Allah, where do I find you? Oh, where can I find you, O oh God?" And allegedly, uh, the Creator of all, the loving Creator of all, told him, "You'll find me at those whose hearts are broken for me." Find those whose hearts are broken, that's where you'll find me. The hadith is mirrored in Sahih Muslim and Abi Hurairah. So you look it up. If you have an issue, come to me. I'll let you know where it is. Allah Ta'ala likes you to be in submission to Him. He's the creator of all. He gives you. But He doesn't like you to go with, to, him, to Him with arrogance. He, Allah does not appreciate that arrogance that we have sometimes. He likes us to go to Him with transparency and love, not arrogance. Arrogance and love don't meet. If we go with arrogance, we're veiling ourselves. Go humble with love, and you will receive. Ihdina, guide us. Ihdina surat al mustaqim and guide us surat al mustaqim A lot of people think this is about religion. Guide me to be a good religious person. Not only that, when you say Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim, Allah says, the path of those you've graced, the path, of the, the path of those you've graced in their health, in their wealth, in their family, in their studies, in their children, in their country, in their city, you've shown your grace on them. Give me that path and allow me to be with them in that path. You've got to live it, you can't just say it. Um, the next question is, there is a hadith that says, paraphrasing, every religion has an essence and the essence of Islam is haya. So could you explain that hadith and what haya means? I'm terrible in scanning a hadith in my mind if there is a said in English. My mind is programmed to scanning the hadith only if they're in Arabic format, unfortunately. So I... Again, English is my second language or my third language, so you gotta forgive me for that. I don't, I can't recall the hadith, but I, I can sort of understand what you're saying. All right, haya means um, let, let's say the opposite of being belligerent, the opposite of being haya does not mean being timid. Or naive. Haya is, is a collection of things. Being respectful, dignified, acting in a dignified way. 
acting in a respectful way, uh, respecting self and others, not being belligerent, these kinds of meanings, haya means. No. Uh, the next question is, if someone is interested in Islam, but not if it is not yet a Muslim, how would you go about helping them to come to Islam, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides? You just gave the answer. <laughs> Islam is about, it means love and submission. It's the Islam. You allow, you, you open your heart to the love from Allah and you channel it. Meaning, because we're all equipped, we are actually created, designed to receive love and to give it. And I always say, there is no shortage of love out in the universe that Allah Ta'ala put. It's just our willingness to tap into that and take it in. A lot of people have lots of aspects of, a lot of people who have these kinds of things have lots of aspects of Islam. Islam tells you to love your parents, to love your neighbor, to love uh, your community, to do good. All these are aspects of Islam. And uh, guidance, meaning, you know, fully, wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly embracing and walking the feet of the Prophet ﷺ, which is a road well traveled. Like you said, that's the guidance that comes from the Creator of all. You can only, we can only pray and, and uh, pray for our, our health and their health and our salvation and theirs and give the best we can. Yeah. Well, next question is, how can you control your desire to do something wrong? We believe in Islam that everything is Allah Ta'ala created things, this universe in a, ba in a very balanced way. Things are balanced. Anything negative you generate, there's going to be ramifications for it. Worst case scenario is when you don't actually feel that there's ramification for it. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ فِي سورة الْبَقَرَةِ وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ if they're told, don't commit corruption and evil on earth. But we are only people who do good. Allah says, In fact, indeed, they are the people who spread evil on earth. But then Allah seals the verse by saying, but they lost the sense to distinguish between good and evil. They don't long, they no longer distinguish it. So if anyone thinks that they can do evil and get away with it, you've got a bigger problem than that. Your problem is not knowing that the creator is just. You've got an iman issue, actually. Not that you, no one can get away with evil. There's no such thing in, from a, an Islamic spiritual perspective. Even the mere thoughts, right? So we're talking about three levels: words, uh, uh, thoughts, actions first, words, and thoughts. You do it, you're gonna suffer it. Generating this negative energy into the universe will have direct and immediate ramifications onto you, even if it's just intention. You have not carried it out in words, nor have you carried it out in actions. You've just, you've been generating all these negative thoughts. You are just putting yourself under siege with lots of negative things and actual real ramifications for it. And, and just so you realize that the mere thoughts actually bring harm, meaning bring evil. Uh, you attract that. Look at Surah Al-Qalam about the Ashab Al-Jannah. Right? Just read it and see. These guys, when they intended to prevent uh, needy people from having uh, charity. Look what happened. You haven't even done anything yet. Fa'asbahat um, The next question is, how does one keep our spirituality alive every single day in our fast-paced world? <laughs> your, relationships, your relationship with Allah is what you put into it. Let me tell you this way. It's like every other relationship on this radical level. If you are married, your marriage is what you put into it. If you are a student here, 
we're all, I'm still a student. Uh, if you're a student, I'm actually still, I'm really a student. I'm not just, I'm not saying you out of being humble, I'm actually a student at the university as well. I teach and I study. I like to be a student for the rest of my life, I don't know why. I'm like the kind of guy that I would love not to move from the university and stay always there. I don't know if that's a good thing, but anyway. My father, Rahimahullah, used to say, a good student never graduates. So I took that literally. <laughs> I don't know if he agrees with it now. But anyway, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> What was the question again? Oh yeah, it's what you put into it here at the university. It's what you put into it. You don't put it in anything in that relationship with your degree program. You're not gonna get anything out of it. Even studying requires you to put love. Now I'm not just talking about religion. Absolutely religion requires you to put love. But if her studying requires you, there's that radical rule about love. If you don't put it, you're never going to get anything out of it. I'll tell you, a physician who doesn't love medicine, he's not going to be good at it. An engineer who doesn't love med uh, his engineering will not be good at it. A journalist who does not love, will not be, would not be good at it. An IT professional does not, would not, a worker, anyone who does, a cook who does not love what they're doing would not, will not be good at it. You have to put love in any relationship. That's the radical law of love that Islam tells you. If you don't put in it, you're not going to get in. By definition, if you don't put love every day with your salah, with your dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with your relationship with Allah ta'ala, don't blame anyone. It's, you're going to give, what I say, giving is living. The more you give, the longer you live. That's an absolute, I made that rule, I'm going to put C on it, copyright. <laughs> yeah, in that form, not, not in the essence, and the essence is in the Quran, but the words. Uh, <laughs> if you don't give, you're not going to get to live. Those people who hold out and they don't give to others because they think keeping, withholding makes them grow, Al Quran belies you. Calling zakah is a way to grow, and zakah is to give, not to withhold. Whether it's your time, your sincerity, your money, your effort, all that stuff. The more you withhold, the more you will be withheld from. You will be withheld. The more you give, the more Allah Ta'ala will, will, the longer you live. There is no if and buts about that. Let's not fool ourselves. That's why zakah means to grow. Linguistically speaking, zakah, qad aflaha man tazakka, right? Zakah means to grow. But zakah means actually that you give. What do you mean give and grow? Well, give and you'll take. Nah? Um, the next question is, how can we learn more about spirituality? Also, how do I become a saint? What do I need to do? <laughs> Transparency with Allah. If you're transparent, congratulations, you're a saint. Just increase that transparency of yours. Be good with Allah and be good with the creation. Love the creator, love the creation. I mean, what do you want me to tell you? There's one word, love, that's all you have to do. If you don't do it, there's a problem. You're not loving yourself. Those who shortchange people from love or the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala from giving, from uh, showing love, they're shortchanging themselves, no one else. So it's, it's the ball is in your court. Uh, next question is, how can we uh, how can we bring correlation between our mind and body and heart and avoid hypocrisy? All right. Synchronization is, is a practice. Because especially if we haven't been haven't been used to sort of transparency with Allah. So today, especially in this world today, this world is sort of we live in a world today that's designed to rob you of every moment of clarity. Right? You have the oldest, I'm, I'm that old that I remember, you, you know, e emails going to a computer actually, you had a big computer and, you know, the small screen usually and thick screens like this. You carry it, sometimes you need help to carry the screen. Nowadays you have iPhone, iPad, iPod, and there's the rest of i 
I, I is there. And when you sleep, you put it next to you and you have all these, uh, all these alarms to tell you, oh, eh, eh, you got a message, eh, eh, you got an email. You're, sometimes we need to unplug to plug. I'm not saying unplug totally, unfortunately we can't. I love this, I still love those days. I lived in the days uh, where we had one phone at, in the house and that was a landline, meaning there was nothing called cell phones, obviously. And uh, I remember that phone had that dial pad, remember that dial pad? And, and that was for like biceps. Because <laughs> you, you do like this, and you leave, whoa, man. You, like this, whoa. You know, I, I remember them, right? And I mean, you, you could actually practice your triceps, biceps with, you know, with really, yeah, it's, it's literally because, and then you had to memorize everybody else's number. Right, or you go to a phone book right next to it, and I, I remember being a kid. I had to memorize all my aunts and uncles' numbers and everybody and their neighbors, obviously, because some of them did not have phones. I had to remember the, you know, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 the shops number, because we had to call the shop. Says, hey, hey, can you get, to, can you get us your neighbor? Because we, we have a phone call, you know. So you gotta be nice to the neighbor, to the, to the shopkeeper, and you know. And I remember those days. I know I'm older than all of you, probably. Anyway, look, so uh, sometimes we've got to unplug to plug, and these I things, give them a break sometimes. To, I'm not saying, well, it was give them a break. Get some mental clarity and, and synchronize, especially, all right, the salah is five times a day. All right, that's a good, it's five minutes, takes you five to six, seven, ten minutes to pray. I'm not saying read al-Baqarah. Read ya akhi Ali Imran. <laughs> All right, read al feel read whatever you want, read al kautha What I'm saying is read a short one, but be present. Don't rob yourself from that time. My father always used to say, there are people who rob people from their, uh, from their money. He says, that's easy. The worse than that is those who rob people from their time. Because you can make money, but you can never, ever get time back. There's one thing you will never, ever, ever be able to get back. Time. Allah tells you in the Quran. There's no, you can get back faith. You lose faith, you get it back. You lose money, you get it back. You lose your degree, don't lose that. Money. You get it back. You fail a test, you get it back. I failed psych. I, I failed psychology. It's the only course I failed in college, in grad school, psychology, psychiatry. And I blame it on the teacher. <laughs> I do, absolutely do. She gave me 40. <laughs> 70 is passing. I mean, I don't like, that's why I don't like psychiatry. I have friends who went to the child psych and all these things. I hate psychiatry, man. And all these people that go into psychiatry, there's a problem with them anyway to start with. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There are lots of good psychiatrists. But anyway, so look, it's, it, it, it's, it's really important to sort of synchronize, be present. That five times, be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't rob yourself from your time. You'll be robbing yourself. You're praying anyway. Don't just give Allah your body. Don't give Him lip service. Give Him heart service. He wants, he wants your heart also, not just your, your lips. I'm saying, Alhamdulillah, give, give me something. And that's why some of our istighfar, I always say, requires an istighfar. You know how people say, after and he's looking at the, I'm going to show you. And he's already planning to do evil. And he's saying, oh Allah, give me forgive, forgiveness, forgiveness. I, that istighfar requires an istighfar. You have to, Ya Allah, astaghfirullah for what I just did, the istighfar I just did. Don't rob yourself from your time. And you will, you will find a difference in your life once you bring your heart to the salah with you. Just bring your heart. I, I know you probably can't be present the whole salah, even if it's milliseconds. Bring your heart with you. Wallahi, your life will be different. Just one last question. It's uh, Sheikh, how do you put on your turban so nicely? Mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> Hadith is Sahih Imam Muslim and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, "Inna Allah Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal." Allah is beautiful and He likes beauty. So I like beauty in everything, 
and amongst them the imam, for example. But I'm sure all of you are beautiful and I see beauty in everything, so it makes no difference. And I don't know how to do it, by the way. Somebody else does it for me. <laughs> Jazakallah khair again, Sheikh. This, this was a very, very uh, inspiring and transformative message that you shared with us. Jazakallah khair for everything, for coming here. Shukran to you.